are followers of Christ. We face an enemy who wants to label, divide, and destroy. We must take our stand in this world and put on the full armor of God. We must be unified. We are one in Christ. In Him, all physical and worldly labels disappear. His love for us has nothing to do with merit, ethnicity, or upbringing. It has everything to do with God choosing to make us alive in Christ, to redeem us through the blood of His Son. This is our fight. This is our calling. We will walk worthy. Welcome to Thompson Pentecostal Assembly and our online service today. We are so glad that you're with us. Whenever and wherever you're watching, thank you for joining us today. We are here in Thompson, Manitoba, beautiful northern Manitoba, and we're glad that you're with us today. Um, uh, our service is going to start in just a couple minutes, but we do have a few announcements for you this morning before we get started. We want to get you up to date on what's happening here in Thompson Pentecostal Assembly. Uh, a couple opportunities for you. First of all, uh, TPA Speaks is a new feature that we've had. We want to hear from you. Um, we all love hearing from our friends and uh, church family. And uh, we like to, uh, to, to play what, uh, what you're thinking about, what you're talking about. We have a question that we would like you to answer. Um, and we want you to record your answer just on your phone or your mobile device or whatever and send it to Pastor Fred at thompsonchurch.ca. It doesn't have to be long. Here's the question that we want you to answer for TPA Speaks, and we can play it uh, during our Sunday morning service. And the question is this, what are you doing now that's different? What has changed in your life because of COVID? And is that change a permanent one or a temporary one? So what has changed in your life because of COVID? And is that a temporary change or a permanent change? So answer that question for us. Have somebody record it and send it to Pastor Fred at thompsonchurch.ca and you can see yourself uh, right here on our Sunday morning service. That's TPA Speaks. Also, uh, church at home, uh, something we've been talking about for some time. We are ready and set to launch. Um, we are looking for host homes, uh, people that are willing to host other families or friends in their homes to do church together. Uh, we recognize that not everybody's going to be ready to return uh, to uh, large group gatherings uh, for church in person. They're more comfortable doing church uh, in smaller groups in their homes. Uh, so we want to make a way for you to do that together in community because we recognize, and we all do, that isolation is also not healthy. Uh, so doing church at home with others is church at home. Uh, so if you are interested in being a church at home host, um, you can go to our website, uh, thompsonchurch.ca, go to the resources tab, and there is a fillable form there for you where you can fill out uh, some information uh, and we can get you started as a host home. Once we have some host homes, then we'll begin to uh, match up some families that want to be hosted, uh, or you can invite people to your home. And when we're allowed to, when we're permitted to have people in our homes, we'll begin launching church at home where people can meet together at home and do church together. Um, pretty soon, we're going to be asking families that want to be hosted, um, that want to go and visit with other families and do church together. Uh, we'll be gathering a list of names as well. And we'll be putting those two things together. So if you are, you're a host home and you're looking for people to come to your home, but you're not sure who to invite, we'll be able to help you with that as well. So go to our website. Uh, if you're interested in being a church at home host uh, and go to the resources tab and look for the church at home fillable form, you can either print that off uh, and fill it out and send it to us, uh, or you can fill it out online and send it to us that way as well. Thanks, and uh, we're going to get to worship, but before we do, let's spend a moment and, uh, and pray. Thank you, Father, for today. We thank you for the good news that Jesus has come, 
and he is risen, and he is our Savior. Father, we thank you for the goodness and the graciousness that the cross and the empty grave, that we can enjoy your goodness every day. This morning, as we prepare to, to worship together and, uh, and sing your praises together, Father, I pray we would not be spectators of worship, but we would participate in worship. We would lift your name. We would glorify your name. Father, we would raise our hands, that we would raise our voices, that we would clap, that we would sing, that we would dance, however you would lead us, Father God, that we would step out in praise and worship because you are worthy this morning. Father, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of where we find ourselves today, you are worthy of every bit of praise and every bit of our worship. So we give you praise and glory today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship together this morning. Amen?
this morning we are about to go into a moment of prayer. We're going to bring our needs before the Lord. But before we do that, I want to bring you up to date on a couple of needs that we've been, been praying for. Because while it's important that we bring our needs before the Lord, it's also important to know when prayers are being answered. Isn't that right? Well, we've been praying for our friend Benita. And uh, we know that uh, Benita had COVID and uh, has had some serious health issues. And uh, I want you to know that there's been some progress in Benita's health. She's had some uh, difficulties with her, uh, with her mental capacities since uh, she's had COVID. But uh, she's recently begun to respond and begin to communicate um, and that's a very, very good sign. That's a recent development, and we're so grateful that God has begun to, to heal her mind and her brain. At the same time, though, um, uh, that means that Benita is now aware that she's lost her husband, Alberto. So at the same time, as we're thankful that, that her mind is being healed, we know that uh, she is grieving now the loss of her husband. So continue to pray for her healing and pray for uh, her comfort. Also, many of you have been praying for my sister, um, who uh, was uh, having uh, serious liver issues. Um, they finally diagnosed um, my sister with autoimmune hepatitis, and she's being treated for that, and she's out of hospital now. And I thank you very much for praying for my sister, Jane. Um, she wants to pass on her thanks, um, and uh, we are uh, believing that God will continue to, uh, to heal and, and keep her. So um, whatever need you have today, this morning, as we, as we pray, you bring it before the Lord. Uh, just lift a hand this morning where you're at. Whatever your need is, God will, will, will be there and he will see and he'll recognize your need today. You know, we don't have to inform God of our needs. He knows what our needs are. But he asks us to, to bring our needs to him so that we recognize that he is our source of help. He is the place that we can go to. So let's do that this morning. Father, you see those needs this morning represented by hands that are raised, God. You know what's going on in those lives. This morning, we, we just acknowledge and we recognize that, that many and most of these needs are things that we can do nothing about. They are outside of our control. And Father, some of them we've struggled with on our own. We've tried to fix them on our own. We've, we've done whatever we can do. And God, it seems helpless or hopeless for us to, to try anymore. And this might be our last resort. Father, we bring them to you and ask you to intercede on our behalf. Father, we pray for the health of our family and our friends and our loved ones. Father, that you would touch their bodies and heal them, Lord God, because your word says you are the great physician. You are the healer. You are the healer of our bodies, Lord God. You are the healer of our emotions, of our minds. We pray for Benita this morning, Lord God, that you would continue to heal her mind, Lord God, and restore her to health. Father, we pray for the relationships in our families and, and our, our loved ones, Lord God, that are broken and are stressed by COVID and all that's going on, Lord. And we pray that you would uh, intercede in there, Lord God, and you would touch those relationships and bring people back together. Father, we pray for uh, our community, Lord, that uh, is, you know, hurting in so many ways, Father. We pray that you would be the, the, the God of comfort here, Lord. We know that there are people who have lost loved ones and who have been unable to grieve, Lord. We pray that you would be with them, Father. Be their comfort, Lord. Be the, the healing salve on their hearts, Lord God, that, that heals those wounds. Father, as we see the end coming to this pandemic, Father, May we be patient and gracious, Lord God, with our leaders, Lord, as they, as they guide us through to the end. Father, may we be gracious and patient with one another, Lord, as we all walk a, a, a path, Lord, through this, this trying time. May we be loving and caring, Lord God, to, and kind to, to others who see things differently than we do. And Father, we thank you for what you've done already, and you've done so much for us, Lord. We thank you for the provision that you've provided for us, the way you've kept us, and the way you've, you've provided for our financial needs and our physical needs, God. 
We give you praise and glory for what you've done. And God, we're excited for what you're about to do. And we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, it's good, again, to have you with us today. Uh, just one more uh, announcement for you. You know, we, we try our best to, uh, to make people feel welcome as they come to our church when they come and visit in person. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, and when, when you came to the building, there was someone at the door who would greet you there and would shake your hand and make you feel welcome and, and give you a smile. And, you know, in an online world, it's difficult to do that, but not impossible. And so we're trying to find a way to make people in an online environment feel welcome at our service. And so we're looking for people who would be online greeters. We're looking to build a team of individuals who are comfortable with technology, who are comfortable saying hello and making people feel welcome in an online environment. So if that's somebody like you, somebody who wants people to feel welcome, somebody who wants people to feel a part of community, and somebody who's not uncomfortable with technology, could you reach out to us, please? And let us know if you'd like to be a part of that new team, that online greeting team. Um, of course, our goal is not to overwork people, so we would uh, try and keep your service to one Sunday a month, but we'd like to have somebody at our online service every week just greeting people and letting them know that we're glad they're there, that we're glad that you've joined us. So if you could send an email to info at thompsonchurch.ca, uh, and let us know that uh, you're interested in uh, joining our online greeting team. Um, and uh, that would be great. We're going to start formulating a, a plan to, to get that going. And, and uh, that would be very helpful for us to, to help grow our sense of community for our online service. So have you ever found yourself thinking that life has gotten more complicated? That things used to be simple, but now life is just more confusing, it's more convoluted, and it's more perplexing now more than ever? And have you ever thought something like that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus? When you started your faith journey, it seemed simple enough. You know, surrender, confess, and then serve the king. But now, maybe a few years or maybe decades later, you're feeling like the journey of following Christ has become much more complicated. You often find yourself wondering, what exactly does God want from me? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, 13 gives us God's clear expectations for each of us who call ourselves a disciple of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So, let's clear up any confusion. God wants us to be transformed into the image of his Son. When you surrender your life to Christ, you instantly change your citizenship. You become a member of God's family. You become a citizen of heaven. But you still look like a member of your old family. Your attitudes, your heart condition, your compassions, your sense of justice, your desires all still resemble your old life. And God wants you to allow him to change you, to mold you and shape you into someone who is more like his son Jesus. That, folks, is spiritual maturity. That's growing up spiritually. Now, do you notice that the criteria or proof that we are growing up spiritually is? Do you notice what the criteria is? 
What does Paul say will be the evidence that we are maturing as believers? Well, it isn't gray hair. Being a follower of Jesus for a long time is not evidence of maturity. He doesn't say, or scripture doesn't say, it's how much money we give. Or how much good work we contribute that is proof of our maturity. It isn't whether we can pray in tongues or not, or lay hands on the sick and that they're healed. Or whether we can lead worship or preach that are signs of spiritual maturity. Paul says, when we walk in unity, that is evidence that we are mature in our faith. So if you're wondering whether you are growing up spiritually, take a look at how well you get along with other believers. If you can continue on in relationship with people who disagree with you, if you can love and care for people who don't look like you, who don't think like you, and if you can pray for people who have betrayed you and hurt you, you are showing signs of spiritual maturity. Now, conversely, if you stop connecting with someone who disagrees with your political or your spiritual beliefs, if you end your relationship with someone who has a different position on vaccines or what the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, or if you can't pray for someone who doesn't like you, then there is very little evidence that you are growing up spiritually into the image of Christ. We often look at unity as a sign of church health. A unified church, a church that is focused on its mission, on what unites it, is often characterized as a healthy church. And I would agree with that characterization. If your church is unified, that is a sign of church health. But according to Ephesians, unity is also a clear indicator of whether the people in that church are maturing in their faith. Unity is a sign of church health and an indication of how mature we are as individuals. If the believers in your church in your church are maturing the way God intended, your church will be united. If your church is unified, the people will be teachable, they'll be correctable, they'll be focused on their mission and they'll be actively serving. And if the individual believers are not growing up to be mature, believers, then your church will be fraught with fractions, divisions, and strife. Let me say that again. If the individual believers are not growing up to be mature believers, then your church will be fraught with factions, divisions, and strife. Today, as we continue our series titled Being Okay, we are going to see what the book of Philippians has to say about being okay by being unified. I want to look at two key verses. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Let's start at Philippians 3, verse 2. It says, Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Now, one chapter over to Philippians chapter 4. Now, I appeal to you, Euodia and Sintucci, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. So, what's going on here? What's the context? What is the Apostle Paul trying to say to his friends at the church in this city of Philippi? Well, in in chapter 3, verse 2, Paul addresses the issue that, that some people in this church, not from outside, not from outside the church, not from that city, not from the community, but from inside the church, Followers of Jesus, fellow Christians, some people were trying to convince the church that the key to salvation was circumcision. That if you really wanted to call yourself the Christ follower, that you had to change your appearance. 
Now, we could spend all day talking about how God is not concerned about uh, the changes on the outside as he is about the changes on the inside or the transformation of your heart. But this message is about unity. Paul is warning the church to pay attention to the people who are actively working at dividing you. This is a concerned pastor telling his church, you need to pay attention to those who are still so immature that they refuse to get along. There are some loud, influential, and persuasive juvenile Christians who don't know how to get along with other people, and they're trying to distract you from your mission. Then in chapter 4, verse 2, Paul speaks to two specific individuals who are in the midst of a dispute. They've had some sort of disagreement. We don't know what it's about. We don't know who's right and we don't know who's wrong. And we don't know who started the argument. All we know is that Paul says it's important to fix it. He says, settle your disagreement. Get together and come to an understanding. Don't just leave it and don't just ignore it. Now, let me get to the point as to why these two scriptures are so important for us today. Being okay by being unified does not happen by accident. Being okay by being unified takes effort. If unity is a sign of maturity, and if unity is a sign of a healthy church, then we must make unity in the church a priority. And if we agree that unity is a priority, then we must come to understand that unity must be protected and cultivated. Now, we're trying something new, and uh, I explained this last week, but I'll explain it again. It's, it's always our goal here at TPA to help tell people not just to go to church or watch church, but to be changed and transformed by the power of God. And one of the challenges with online church is that it's more difficult to be engaged with the church service. Watching church is very different than participating in church. So to help those of you who are watching online, we're introducing something new called 60 Seconds to Go Deeper. We're going to take 60 seconds to focus on a particular point or truth to help you engage with the people you're doing church with. This is an experiment, and we're going to ask you for your feedback. We'd really appreciate you letting us know whether or not this is something you enjoy or not. Do you find this helpful or, or productive? We're going to try this for a few weeks, and then we'll decide whether it's something we want to continue or not. Here's how it works. We're going to put a short discussion question up on the screen with a timer. Discuss it briefly with those you're watching the service together with. If you're watching alone, you can use the chat feature on whatever platform that you're watching on. There's other singles there that will be able to engage with you, or TPA staff will be able to engage with you. Remember, it's only 60 seconds, so you don't need to take a long time. So our first 60 seconds to go deeper question today is this. Why should being unified be a priority in your church or any other organization that you're a part of? Go ahead, take 60 seconds right now. Welcome back. 
Hopefully you had some good discussion there. So Paul gives his church a heads up and says, be on the lookout for people who want to divide you. There are people you need to protect yourself from. These people are enemies of unity and you need to be aware of who they are and what they're doing. Church, we need to be keenly aware that there are people who call themselves Christians that want to see the church divided. It would be naive to think or to assume that everyone who calls TPA their church home are all working from the same playbook. Unfortunately, some people don't fully understand our mission at TPA. Some people understand but are slow to get on board with the mission. And some people are just focused on their own mission and not TPA's mission. Or some people have no particular mission at all. But they know they don't like the one here at TPA. And all of those people can have a negative impact on the unity of our church. And while we need to make sure that we protect the unity of the church from people like that, it's important to note that none of those people are bad people. Now, people who are learning who we are, they just need more time and teaching so they can get on board with the mission. And those who are taking just a little more time to take up the mission, they need patience as well. But people who have their own mission and people who reject the mission of TPA can cause a great deal of damage to the unity of the church. And we need to protect ourselves from those kinds of people. I remember a pastor and his wife we worked with many, many years ago telling us a story of how they had to protect their church from some people like that. They had, they had planted a brand new church and it was growing and thriving. And some people from another church in that same city who had been causing a great deal of strife and division and unrest heard about the good things that were happening at this new church plant. And the pastor's wife told me that one Sunday she felt impressed on her heart by God to, to go to the door and just greet people. It's not something she did on a regular basis, but she just felt it important that morning to go to the door and just welcome people to the service. And that morning, these people who had been causing all the strife and difficulty at this other church showed up at her church. And she says so she felt this unction in her spirit as these people came in to speak to them. And, and she pulled them aside and quietly uh, pulled them away so as not to embarrass them. She said to them this. She said, I know who you are. I know what you've done at your other church. If you intend to do that here, you can just turn around and leave right now. You see, unity is precious and it needs to be protected there are wolves running around and they are after the sheep. Sometimes the shepherd needs to be bold in protecting the flock because the sheep have no natural defenses. If it is your intention to cause division or factions in the church, in any church, be clear that a shepherd may very well have to come and protect their sheep. If we want unity, we will need to make sure we work to protect it. It also means we need to cultivate it. Now, cultivate is a farming term, and I know there are people here in Thompson right now that are itching to get out there and cultivate. Cultivate means to prepare and use the land for crops. Cultivation is the work that is done before the crops are planted and harvested. If our goal is to bear fruit, fruit like unity, peace, a sense of common purpose, healthy relationships, if we want that fruit, we need to do some cultivation, some preparation. Preparing the soil of your life to bear fruit like unity means you'll need to turn over some soil, some hard ground. 
If you want to grow some vegetables in your backyard, you need to first cultivate the soil, get rid of the grass, pull up all the old roots, pick out the rocks, then get rid of all the weeds. If you just throw the carrot seeds down on top of the grass, if you just throw your seed potatoes down on top of your lawn, it's very unlikely you're going to get any kind of crop. If you want to grow a crop, you need to cultivate the ground first. And if you want unity in your church, you better be prepared to cultivate the ground in your own life. In the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Jesus talks about different kinds of soil and how those soil types accept the seed of the gospel. Jesus isn't talking about actual dirt. He's talking about your heart condition. He's talking about your attitudes. Some attitudes are hard-hearted and can't accept anything, and the seed gets taken away. Some have just a little bit of soil over rock that only allows a little growth. Some soil is filled with weeds and it chokes out anything growing, but cultivated soil is ready for seed and seed is received and it grows. Cultivated soil in your life is ready to grow seed means you don't let your heart get hard. When there are disagreements or hurts, you deal with those things so your heart stays soft. You make sure, just like Paul says to Euodia and Sintucci, Hey, get that disagreement worked out. Soil that is ready for unity has enough depth to it that good relationship roots get down deep where the scorching heat of personality differences, different viewpoints and perspectives, or even periods of separation can't rob your unity of the relationship moisture it needs to survive. Have you wondered about relationships that that fell apart during the pandemic or relationships that survived, what the difference was. I know that I've had some some relationships that, that haven't survived COVID and I've had some relationships that have survived and thrived. I can tell you the ones that, that survived COVID are the ones that had deep roots. Ones that the relationships had been deep, deep, deeply rooted. We'd gone through stuff before. So the roots were deep. The moisture, the relationship fluid that needed to be there was was accessible. Shallow relationships were starved, were burnt up by COVID. And soil that is ready to grow unity isn't filled with weeds. There aren't so many casual relationships in the soil that rob the important relationships of the nutrients it needs to survive. If you want a church that bears the fruit of unity, be ready to protect your church, the unity of your church, by dealing with anyone who would seek to harm it and cultivate your life so that unity can grow there. Please hear me clearly today. Do not start looking at people in your church as suspects. Do not look for a demon behind every door. Do not interpret every comment or criticism as someone attempting to sow division or disunity. Being unified does not mean we all think the same or that we agree on every point. People can have various viewpoints, opinions, and ideas about things. We are unified when we move forward with a common purpose and goal in spite of seeing some things differently. People are never our enemy. People are never the problem. It is always about the heart condition. I want to finish today's message by bringing to light those things that are genuine enemies of unity. These are the attitudes that if they are active in our lives that can do great damage to the church and the kingdom building work we are called to. I'm going to be honest, this is going to be hard for some of you to listen to because when I read this next scripture, you may feel a stab of conviction in your heart. Because you know you struggle with these kinds of attitudes. 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, clearly identifies the enemies of unity. So turn over there. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. This is not your pastor speaking. This is God's word. It says, uh, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Complaining and arguing. Two things that you may not have expected are the greatest enemies in the unity to unity in the body of Christ. The enemy of unity is not hard times. It is not difficult circumstances. Unity is not at risk from lower than expected giving. Unexpected expenses are not an enemy of unity. Unity in the church is not derailed by making changes to how we organize a Sunday service or by using a new curriculum in kids' ministry. Unity is not damaged by how many potlucks we have or whether we have one or two Sunday services, whether we sing three or four or five songs on a Sunday morning. That does not affect the unity of the church. But complaining and arguing will eventually make the strongest and healthiest churches weak, anemic, and ineffective. The biggest enemy of unity is not change. It isn't difficulty. It isn't even Satan and his demons. The greatest enemy to unity is selfishness. I warned you, this part of the series might sting a little bit. Whenever we begin to allow God to work in an area of our life that involves challenging our selfish desires, there is bound to be some pushback from our human nature. Every single person that has ever lived, without exception, has struggled with selfishness. We want what we want. Philippians 2.21, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Unfortunately, the sinful hearts we are born with are always inclined to go after what we want and not what God wants. From the moment we are born, we are wired to have our own needs met first. Even the most innocent and adorable of babies cries to be fed, cries to be changed, and cries to be picked up. No one has to train your toddler to be demanding. They come by it naturally. A child has not been born yet that says, no mom, you look after yourself first. I can wait for my snack. No two-year-old has the attitude that says, I'm okay with waiting for you to finish what you're doing before you look after my needs. No, all humans start out with the attitude that says, I want it and I want it now. Now, as we grow and mature, hopefully we learn that the entire world does not revolve around what we want. I trust that when you are a grown-up, when you want something, you aren't going to say to your spouse, I want it and I want it now. Adults who still want to behave like children are frankly disturbing. But even adults act selfishly. And you can recognize when adults are selfish because when they are selfish, they complain. You see, complaining comes as a direct result of a selfish attitude. Let me repeat that. Complaining comes as a direct result of a selfish attitude. But but pastor, how can you say that? If I point out that something, there's something I don't like or something that isn't good, how is that being selfish? Well, that's a really good question. You ask excellent questions. Let me try and answer that for you. First of all, constructive criticism and correction are not the same as complaining. You can critique something without complaining. As well, if there is something going on in my life that shouldn't be, 
and you bring that to my attention, that is correction. That is not complaining. Now, let me try and break this down for you a little bit more. Every week, our staff meets together. We meet to to plan our ministries and discuss upcoming events. And we also try and constantly try working out growing our leadership capacity. As well, a regular part of our, our staff meetings is to evaluate the effectiveness of our ministries. How are we doing? Are we reaching as many people as we can? Is, is there anything that we can do differently that could be, help us spread the gospel more effectively? Every week we ask the same questions about our Sunday service, whether it's online or in person or both. Every staff member is asked, what did we do well and what can we improve on? And every aspect of our service is evaluated. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The opening video, ah, it didn't make any sense. Didn't really fit. We can do better. The worship team did a great job. The transitions were really smooth. Ah, the pastor's message was a bit too long. We probably lost a few people because of that. And on and on it goes, and we make adjustments and changes, so we remove as many roadblocks as possible that might prevent people from from hearing the saving message of Jesus. Now, the difference between constructive criticism or personal correction and complaining is, complaining focuses on what you want and need, and constructive criticism is focused on what others need. When you complain that the worship leader picked songs you don't like or that their style doesn't suit you, that's selfish. When you complain that the church isn't meeting your needs or your kids' needs, that's selfish. When you complain that the pastor doesn't visit or call you enough, guess what? That's selfish. And for a church to walk in unity, we need to stop believing that church is about us and what we need and start believing that church is about people who haven't surrendered their life to Christ and what they need. Does your church try and have music that new people can connect with? Does your church focus on finding ways to make it easier for unsafe people to find their way in? Is your church focused on making the people who are already here happy? Or is it focused on removing barriers for new people so they can find Christ? If your issue is more focused on what makes you happy than is focused on others, you are not helping, you are complaining. And James chapter 4 makes it clear what creates division and destroys unity. James chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get, can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong, and you only want what will give you pleasure. If your church isn't meeting your needs, stop complaining and start praying. If your church isn't meeting your needs, stop complaining and start praying. Start praying for your pastor. Start praying for your pastors and your leaders. And one of two things is gonna happen when you do. First of all, if your attitude is wrong and you are being selfish, God's going to change your heart and you'll begin to see your church and its leaders differently. Or if you are right and your heart is in the right place and your leaders are wrong, then God's going to change your pastor's heart and the heart of your church leaders. Either way, if you pray instead of complain, you will come out a winner. Either way, if you pray instead of complain, you come out a winner. Now, we're going to take time for our second 60 seconds to go deeper question. So take 60 seconds to talk about this question. 
How does complaining demonstrate a selfish attitude? Go ahead, 60 seconds, starts now. Welcome back. So I want to close with with something much more positive and exciting. I'm so happy and pleased to say that that our church, my church, this church that God has blessed Thompson with is not filled with complaining. Now from time to time, we all need to check our attitudes in this area, me included. Whether it's in our church or at work, in our marriage or in any relationship, we can all be accused of being complainers from time to time. Look at what Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So continue, church, to be tender and compassionate especially towards those who need to surrender their lives to Christ. If you are only giving casual support or you live by the motto, no news is good news, I encourage you to wholeheartedly agree with us here at TPA. Do not just be a a, a tacit onlooker. Give vocal support. Actively be unified with your church. Continue to work together. Be unified in our purpose to see Thompson transformed by the love of Jesus. And always be humble and put others and their needs above your own. That is unity. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that you've given us an example of what it means to be humble and selfless. And God, we know it's such a struggle for us as individuals, as humans, to not be selfish, to not want our own way, to not want to do things that suit us first. God, help, help remind us when we're being selfish. Help us by, by, by poking us when we're complaining. Help poke us when we're, when we're being argumentative. Help us to be actively protecting the unity of our church. Help us to cultivate the attitude, the the conditions of our heart that that it tears up the rocks and pulls out the weeds so that unity can grow in our lives. And so that the fruit that we want to see in our church grows in us first. And God, that will be what, what, what draws people to this place. We thank you, Father, that that you have been an example for us, Jesus, of what selflessness looks like. Father, help us to give up our preferences for other people. Help us to give up what we want for the sake of those who don't know you yet. And God, when we are weak, when we we do fail to, to be selfless, God, forgive us. Help us to recover quickly. Help us to ask for forgiveness and help us to be gracious to others, Lord God, who are struggling 
And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, next week we're wrapping up our series, Being Okay. We're going to take a look, uh, end by taking a look at what the fruit of unity is. What grows in a church that is unified? Well, the answer is community. And if you look at the book of Acts and read what the early church experienced, the definition of what they had is community. It was a place that people belonged. A place that people wanted to join and be a part of. And if we want our community to be okay coming here to Thompson Pentecostal Assembly, then we need to be ready to offer them community. Thanks. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.